Shalom. All praise and glory to the mighty Most High, our Creator, who is one God. Blessings to the children of Israel. It's a great day. We're going to jump into chapter 11 <clears throat> real quick, which is the Tower of Babel. Okay. Uh, starting in chapter 11. Now the world all had one language. Look, one. What is one? <laughs> Clearly. In this case here, it would mean three. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. But for, for you Christians, you might want to go ahead and, you know, because you're so used to getting Trinity out of one, you know. But in this case here, now the world all had one language and a common speech. And everybody was united with one speech. One speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stones and tar for martyr. Then they said, Come, let us build a city with a tower that reaches to the sky so that we may make names for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. Let us, huh? Let us, let us. Is this the same let us that is, uh, let us make mankind? Let us again. Let us, this here would be at Genesis 26 and 27. Let us make mankind the Lord. The Lord? The Lord is one, so how can it be let us? Questions, questions, folks. Let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand another, each other, one another. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel, because the Lord confused their language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them all over the face of the earth. Now, there's really only one thing that I want to point out here, and it's kind of, it's an important thing, though. It's very important. Because number one, we're in chapter 11 now, okay? And this is the Tower of Babel. And the world all had one language. Look, there's no S on the end of this. Now the world all had one language. Uh, the world had multiple languages. Chapter 11, note it. Note it down. Chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Now let's pop over here to Genesis chapter 10, 20, and let's read it. These are the sons of Ham and their clans and languages in their territories and nations. There's, always, there's only one language. If we're in chapter 10, and it's telling us that there's multiple languages already, then this has to be a clan or something that's going on outside of Shem's, or excuse me, Ham, by their clans and their languages and their territories and their nations. Also, uh, 31, Genesis 10, 31. What does it say? These are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages. Hold on. How can Shem and Ham have different languages with an S on the end 
when we're in chapter 11 now, and it's telling us that there's all one language. It's all about uh, common sense, folks. Common sense. If we're in this chapter 10, and it's telling us that there's already languages with uh, clans that are speaking languages and territories, then how can all of a sudden it turn back to one language? Question. Let's move on. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, chapter 11 here, picking back up at uh, verse 10 and 11. Uh, from Shem to Abraham, this is the bloodline. We're following the bloodline of the clans now that have come off of the ark. Somebody mentioned to me that I spoke with over the phone that there were more families on the ark other than these four. Because I'm arguing that eight people on an ark couldn't have fed, you know, two to three million animals back then. It couldn't have been done, folks. So, uh, this is the accounts of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, this is two years after the flood, flood. two years after the flood, the most that you could have had after two years, uh, four families, would be an addition of uh, probably about 12 people in two years, four families, even if Noah, Noah and them. If all four families had a child or even even twins, all four of them, give it to them, man. Then, you, then you're up to uh, 16 plus the eight, the original eight would leave you at 24. And then, uh, naturally, those kids ain't of age yet. They can't start having children yet. So, the only ones that could have made children again would be the same four. You see what I'm saying? If you have four families, they can only have one kid apiece, unless there's twins that I was giving you. In that case, if there was twins, then they would have had eight. So if they had eight and eight after two years, there still would have been only 16 plus the original eight would only be 24 people on the earth. Why is that important? Well, we're going to we're going to come around to that. Was 100 years. Remember the names. This is what we're going for. The blood. We want to remember the names in the bloodline of who people are. OK, because it comes later in the Bible. These names come later in the Bible. At least I, I believe they do. I don't know. Anything other than what I learned from Brother Rap the News from for for uh, the year and a half that well almost three years now that I still I watch his content I watch well not as much as I did I watch a lot of other people's content but this was an undergoing that I am taking between me and the Most High because. I've come to realize that both Christians and those children of uh, the Most High, the Creator, the self-existing Eternal One, I've never seen anybody really read the whole Bible. So I just, I thought it would be an undertaking to go ahead and do this. So I have, it. Uh, it's going to be a three, this will be a, anywhere from a three to five year project to write this all down on the board for everybody, read the entire parables, and then nobody on the face of the earth will say, be able to say to me, well, you got to read the Bible. You got to read the whole Bible. You got to read both Bibles. You got to read this. You got to read the whole chapter. You know, you're taking it out of context. No, I'm giving you my theology and where I think that the Bible has went wrong and where the Gentile have grafted themselves into the Bible and the stories don't make, it don't make sense. If the story doesn't make sense, then you have to question it. It says, they say in the court, if one thing is wrong, if you find the character of the person that has told you one lie on the stand, then you need to discard the whole uh, testimony. But a judge will tell you right after she's told you that, 
But if you'd like to go ahead and choose the parts that you think are uh, too good to the case, then take those pieces out and discard what you think. That's what I've learned all this. When I went to court, boy, did I tell you, I learned a great deal going through all of this. Okay, so now we're two years after the flood. The most people that could possibly exist at this point in time, two years after the flood, would be a top of 24 kids. Little babies running around. No adult, all adults taking care of all these kids. You still got at least another 12 to 14 years before the kids that are born right now are even capable of breeding and starting plants, which is very important. He became, okay, two years after the flood, Shem was 100 years old. He became the father of Aphex. Uh, and after he became the father of Aphex, Shem lived another 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Aphaxid had lived 35 years, he became the father of Shelah. And after he became the father of Shelah, Aphaxid lived 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he became the father of Eber. And after he became the father of Eber, Shelah lived another 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber lived 34 years, he became the father of Pelig, and after he had become the father of Pelig, Eber lived another 430 years and had other sons and daughters. These are the names that you're taking with this lesson here. Uh, Shem, Aphaxid, Shela, Eber, and Pelig. Right? One more time. Shem, Aphaxid, Shela, Eber, Pelig. This is what you're pulling out of chapter uh, verses 10 through 17. Eighteen. When Pelig lived thirty years, oh, there we go. We already got Pelig. Okay, lived thirty years. He became the father. Uh, I forgot the father here. The father of Ru, Ryu. Pelig lived another two hundred nine years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru lived thirty two years, he became the father of Sereg. Sarug, okay, and after he became the father of Sarug, Aru lived 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug lived 30 years, he became the father of Nahor, or Nahor, the H may be silent in that as well, Nahor or Nahor, and after he became the father of Nahor, Sarug lived 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor lived in uh, 29 years, he became the father of Terah, okay, and after he became the father of Terah, Naor lived 119 years and had other sons and daughters. After Terah lived 70 years, he became the father of Abraham, or Abram, Naor, and Haran. So we're having a double bloodline here now of Naor, okay. Someone we just named their child uh, Naor. And then this is the Abram's family here. 27, this is the accounts of Terah's family line. And notice here, it's family now. We're not talking about bloodlines anymore because, well, people are fornicating on the face of the earth, man. They're just having at it. They're loving their flesh. They're enjoying their desires. They're falling away from God. They're doing their own thing. I am uh, I really don't think that uh, the people on them that ark could have been uh, what we're told, man. If we're in this, this plane of existence that is just completely shot, let's jump into the rest of what we're talking about now and finish out this chapter. Closing, 27... Terah became the father of Abram, Naor, and Haran. Okay? And Haran became the father of Lot. Okay? While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. So this is probably war already starting. And if this is true, war that is starting, then Haran... Here, 
is the first recorded death after the flood. Okay. As far as I'm reading, I haven't heard any death, man. Here it comes. Getting ready to start going into battles and all that other shit now. Abram and Naor both married. The name of Abram's right wife was Sarah. If uh, somebody wants to correct me on this pronunciation, it may be Sarie, Sarie, Sarah. And the name of Naor's wife was Milkai or Milka. Okay. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milka and Ishka. So, now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and then he died in Haran. Okay, so we're starting, now we're going to start seeing cities. We have Ur, we have Haran. Um, the, where are all these, we're going to start focusing on all of these cities and stuff. I know it's not fun, but those, this stuff, you know, we're going to learn it. That's all I can say. Write down the names, folks. So you have some kind of idea when we get deeper into this Bible, who they are and what's going on. All praise and glory to the mighty most higher creator who is one God. If uh, you are a Gentile or a stranger that is seeking the creator, this is the channel that you can do it. You can also find the same uh, content at my brother Breaking Free from Narcissism. Um, there's not a lot of people that I will throw uh, shout outs for any longer, but I was glad to see you in the comment section the other day again, Anna, Anna, yeah, I'm grateful to see you there that you're still listening. I know that there's been a lot of conflict that's going on in the community uh, between uh, Deshaun and Rakima and even myself and admonishments and a lot of um, slurs and slangs have all been tossed back and forth and that's not what I'm here for. I need people to understand that when we serve the Spirit, the Creator, the self-existing Eternal One, we're all on this train together, okay? And some of us know things that other people don't know. And others know things that some of us don't know. And the whole purpose of this ride is for those to come together. And there's a lot of arguing going on that that is put is a separation, this division that exists between... Um, the nations, the United Nations, and the children of our Creator. The Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of the Living who put His breath on a race of people. And then He created another race of people that don't have His Spirit on them. Okay? And this is what the battle is. This is why it says in Ephesians 6.12, it's not about the flesh and blood. You've got to put the flesh aside, folks. I know that the Bible is written with many parables that speaks about the children of God being dark with their faces to the ground. I get it. I completely get it. But do you think that, that anybody that loved God or those that came to the children of light do then? That there was anybody that may have been of light skin that had their faces down with the children? of the Most High, the Creator, the Spirit of God, we have got to put this black and white battle behind us, this supremacy between those that are of melanated man and those that are of a lighter color. All right? The Bible plainly sees and shares as we get into the next chapter in 12.3 that says, I will bless thee that bless thee, and I will curse thee that curse thee. The, though in these two parables, uh, means the same thing. He is talking about a nation, the United Nations. He will bless the United Nations, those within the nation of the United Nations, people like me, that bless his cho chosen children. Let's stop making this about black and white and make it about what it is. Because once you peel the skin off of your body, what color is evil then? 
okay? Evil is something that is within us, within the soul, okay? When we're born into this realm, we're born in Cain, which is hell below, and Abel. Cain and Abel are a metaphor for the cannibal that fights within the soul, the flesh, the spirit that fights against the flesh. It's telling us in the Bible over and over and over, listen, I'm very humble. I don't know everything about the Bible. I'll take anybody's direction. I'll hear what they have to say. Not that I'm going to take it in and agree with it. I might not agree with it. But that doesn't mean that we have to beat the shit out of each other any longer, man. It just means that we don't agree. Why do people got to be so angry when they don't agree? Okay, there's two sides here. There's good. It's those that serve the spirit of truth the spirit of the living, and then there's bad. There's those that serve the spirit of death, the spirit of lies. The spirit of truth, the spirit of living, created evil, the spirit of death. The spirit of truth and the living created the spirit of death. And the spirit of death is trying to drag your ass to hell. And the spirit of death doesn't have a color to it, all right? He's going to drag anybody he possibly can down to that fire, so let us put our differences aside about the color of flesh and call it what it is, evil against good. Evil comes in all colors, folks. All colors, as well as good comes in all colors. I'm here to serve the Most High and bring the Gentile back to the rightful worship of the Spirit of God and to bless His people, the chosen children. All praise and glory to the mighty most higher creator who is one God. Blessings to you, the children that serve the most high. And those of you that don't, I am so sad for you and where you're going. Blessings.